citizens of the city here since the way back when uh, the city fathers decided that uh, 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 securing this land would be appropriate, would be appropriate place to invite a university, and uh, this is just the beginning of a long-range program. There's an old Chinese proverb that says all journeys begin with one step. For George Mason University, the first step was taken in 1949 by the University of Virginia's Board of Visitors. The board approved the opening of an adult education extension in Northern Virginia. Step number two came in 1957 when the board approved the establishment of a two-year branch campus to be called University College. It's sort of astonishing to see the university today and to, to imagine that it started out in an abandoned elementary school in 1957. The student body never totaled any more than 200 at Bailey's Crossroads. Once we started here in 1964 in Fairfax, uh, we actually moved out the entire school in a day and a half in two moving vans. Now called George Mason College, the institution and its nearly 200 students relocated to Fairfax, where its four new buildings are open for business. The North, South, East, and West buildings are the first college facilities in the Commonwealth with air conditioning. UVA's Lauren Thompson is named Chancellor of George Mason College. His mission is to ready this new college to become an independent regional university. Lauren Thompson working with Till Hazel by an additional 421 acres over a three-year period from 66 to 69. Um, in order to sell this to the local jurisdictions, Thompson suggests that for $4.50, the price of a steak dinner at the time, for each Northern Virginia resident, they could buy enough land to build a quality regional university. At the urging of Thompson, student activists, legislators, and business leaders, the General Assembly agrees the road to independence is now complete. On April 7, 1972, Governor Linwood Holton signs legislation establishing George Mason University as an independent member of the Commonwealth System of Colleges and Universities. Under the presidencies of Virgil Dykstra and Robert Krug, the university grows with more students, buildings, and academic programs. Dr. Virgil Dykstra and Dr. Robert Krug succeeded Dr. Thompson, uh, and they oversaw a tremendous building program here on campus. Uh, at one point, we had three major projects going on at the same time. The Library Tower, Robinson Hall, and the Student Union Building. Faculty and staff and students often remarked that the place looked like a war zone. The year is 1978, and the university is now searching for a new president. One of the applicants is an English professor from Temple University. talked to um, Ann Wingblade in preparation for this interview and uh, she told me a couple of stories. One was that uh, when George was recruited to come down here, he, he visited the university several times uh, before he started his official duties. And she kept trying to find George to uh, find out what supplies he wanted in his office. And finally, the day before he was supposed to come down here, she learned that he was over in the security office getting his parking permit. So she rushed over there with her notepad in hand, waited for him. Finally, he came out and she said, what can I get you for your office? So he says, well, I want an in and an out box. I want some quad pads and I want lots of good number two pencils. And, <laughs> and so she was puzzled as to why he would want those quad pads. But then she found him working, doodling on them, and figuring out to scale the vision for the university. And she said that's how he became known as a visionary, because of those quad pads. As George Mason's fourth president, George Johnson is a man in a hurry. He recognizes a region ready to grow and a university poised to help lead that growth. One thing that uh, was very different about Mason then than Mason now was the fact that all the administration fit into the Finley Building, and you could always find a parking spot, which is not the case today. Um, 
other than that, it was really um, a very small campus. It was what struck me was the size of the campus and the fact that it was surrounded by woods. Um, one side was parking lots and the rest of it was all deep woods. So there was a very um, secluded feel to it and it was really a lovely place to work. Within the first year of Johnson's tenure, the university is granted doctoral status and acquires a law school. So few people knew about George Mason's existence. They didn't know, people just a few blocks down the street didn't know that this university was here. And we were quite often referred to, when we were referred to at all in the Washington Post, as George Mason Community College. So the university was very elementary at that stage, both in terms of public perception and in fact what it offered, because it was a small liberal arts college and that's what it was supposed to be. Dr. Johnson came with the goal of changing all that. And he was invited to come by the then rector, Till Hazel, with that mandate to make that change, to make George Mason significant. In 1983, Johnson raises even more eyebrows by successfully recruiting James Buchanan and his Center for Public Choice to relocate to Mason. A year later, a bequest from Clarence Robinson provides Johnson with more opportunities to grow the institution. Johnson tells all who will listen, if we hire good people, then the buildings and students will follow. Three years after arriving at Mason, James Buchanan is awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics. With it comes the attention of the nation and the world. On the heels of the Nobel Prize and the Robinson professors, the university continues to expand and gain a greater presence in the region and throughout the state. Shortly after beginning his 18th year as president, Johnson announces plans to retire in June 1996. Once again, the university faces the challenge of finding a new leader to build on the institution's success, but in a manner that gives its momentum greater precision. Dr. Johnson had continued the academic um, uh, reputation of the university, uh, but there was certainly a need to, con uh, to, to keep that trajectory up. So we needed a leader to come in and continue the, to, to raise the profile of George Mason. We needed a leader to come in and continue to uh, increase the endowment of the university. Um, and uh, we needed a, a leader to be able to negotiate with the powers uh, that be down in Richmond uh, for any state money that we could get. And those were, the, I think, the three major issues that we, or three major attributes that we were really looking for and who we chose to be our next president. One day, we were driving on 66, I was driving on 66, and we drove by this big sign that said George Mason University. And she looks at me and she says, why don't you step down as dean at Cornell and become a professor at George Mason so we could live in Northern Virginia again? This is Sally? This is Sally. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're here because of Sally. Yeah, really exactly. <laughs> With the start of the 1996-97 academic year, George Mason University boasts three thriving campuses and an enrollment of nearly 25,000. It's known nationally for its innovation and entrepreneurial spirit. Alan Merton is the new president. He comes to Mason after serving seven years as dean of the Johnson School of Management at Cornell University. His challenge is to combine the university's youthful vitality with a greater sense of direction and institutional maturity. A couple things needed to happen so that the school would mature after, after the George Johnson years. And we really needed to make sure we were taking care of our core constituencies, particularly our students. And it was a real pleasure when Alan came on board as president from the very first day he made students a focus of his time as president at George Mason. And uh, we all reaped the benefits from that. What I loved and even remember now is just the sense that I felt like I mattered at Mason, that I wasn't just one of thousands of students on campus, um, that George Mason knew that I was here. Recognizing growing demands for a quality higher education, Merton pushes Mason to continue its steady growth. With the help of his academic team, he initiates incentives to encourage greater faculty research, broadens Mason's base with its public, and sets in motion its first comprehensive campaign. The things that have been accomplished uh, by Alan and Sally Merton, uh, I think on, on the recruitment of 
capable freshmen. The GPA for entering students used to be less than 3.0. Now it's more than 3.6. Research uh, has grown from 30 million to 130 million in those uh, 16 years. The space, the academic program space, has been increased by well over one million square feet. Research laboratories like the biomedical research laboratories, all of these things are indication, very positive indications of the success of GMU. And, and so much is attributed to Alan and Sally. In 2002, Vernon Smith brings Mason its second Nobel Prize in economics. Four years later, the men's basketball team brings the university unprecedented attention in the NCAA championship tournament. When I was a student, there was a, a genuine love for Mason, but not the same amount of pride that you see now. Um, and certainly, particularly after the university's run in the Final Four, that was the biggest jump. Um, that watching the pride of students both on campus and off campus. We've been recognized as one of the most, if not the most, diverse student body in America. With the uh, location and the embassies nearby and the ability to network with representatives from other countries, uh, international access is literally at our doorstep. In 2009, U.S. News & World Report magazine names Mason as the number one up-and-coming college in America. The institution's forward trajectory is higher than ever as it moves into the second decade of the new century. The opportunity is tremendous for the future, and it certainly has helped us in the past. The journey of George Mason University continues. Its future carries with it the energy of the past and the vision of the present. What is next is an institution riding on the wings of the future with the knowledge that the best is yet to be.